Okay. All right. If you guys Yes, I do. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to another um, Google Hangout Live Illumination Live. My name is Ian, and I'm the founder of Shows for Kids. And we're going to at the lab on the island of South Sydney. I'm just going to ask the classrooms that are joining us and they can use their microphones. There's a little button right at the bottom with a microphone, you can just touch it and use that. If you guys, um, I don't know where the volume is. Shh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are you waiting for us? Yeah. Oh, yeah. sorry, sorry. Guys, shh. Okay. Every so, time we hear your classroom, it comes up on the video. I'm sorry, can you say that again? If you don't mute your microphone, it actually keeps showing your classroom and the live feed. Okay. So we'll introduce ourselves and then mute the microphone? No, we need you to mute it right now for a second. You need us to sorry? I need you to mute your microphone, please. Okay. Is it muted? Hmm. Are we muted, guys? Yeah. There we go. All right. So, um, my name is Julian, and I'm the founder of Shows for Kids, and we're here today for one of our awesome visits at the biological field. And today we're on the island of South Bimini, Bahamas. It's about 50 miles from the state of Florida in the U.S., and we're going to show you actual shark science in action. So I'm here with the team from the lab, and the shark lab has been here for 25 years, doing amazing shark research on lots of different here in the Bahamas. Some work like conservation action, better protection of sharks, and a lot of information we actually know about sharks has come from the work done here. So I'm going to go ahead and let the team introduce themselves. Then we're going to see the classes that are joining us live on the camera, and then we'll actually jump in and see some live sharks. Hey guys, my name is Emily. I'm a part of the system managers here at the Biological Field Station. Um, I'm going to be from the east coast of Canada. But I live a lot in the Bahamas on Sunny South. Um, I get to help out as a volunteer and stuff like that, but I also really get to uh, help with current research in the field, um, right at the water, beautiful creatures. Um, my name is I'm from Quebec in West Australia, and I volunteer here at the Shaw Park. I've only been here for a week and a half. Hey guys, my name is uh, I'm a research coordinator at the lab. And I am in charge of pretty much all the education opportunities. So I'm working with you guys really in quite a bit, as well as different types of tours we have out here at the lab. But also, I get to do a lot of the research. So my job is both education and research, which is um, one of the very, very cool things we accomplish out here at the lab is provide that education for people alongside the research. All right. And then we're going to introduce you to our special guest. All right, so today you guys are going to meet. Can you guys see this okay? So this is our friend, the nurse shark. It's a pretty young shark. You can see those spots on the belly. They're born with um, And today we're actually going to go through, we're going to learn a little bit more about the shark and what happens when a shark is caught, when a research station, including right here in Bimini, actually goes out to catch sharks. There's a specific thing called a workup that's done, and this is data collection. So today, which you're halfway into different classes, we're actually going to you through what happens when a shark is caught, why it's caught, and the information that's collected with data, and why it's actually really, really important for the animal. So right now, we're just going to go ahead and let the classes into the class. And we're going to start off with, this is Cassette's grade two in Canada. So if you guys want to just go ahead and
and say hi to everybody. Let me see. No, I did it. You guys can go. Yeah. Yeah, if you guys want to go ahead and say hi. And wait. All right. And then we have, I just want to pull this up so I'm here, everybody. And then we have Mrs. Wilson, grade six in Wisconsin. No, maybe this. Uh, do we have Miss Torres, grade two, from Barrett Elementary School in Arlington, Virginia? Hi. Guys. Hi. All right. And then do we have Miss Canty, grade one, in Wentzville, Missouri? I'm going to unmute again. And we're going to go ahead and let me. Because so it's great to say hi again. Can you guys hear us? All right. Very All right. And to everyone else who's watching, um, thank you very much. We're going to get go ahead and start with the presentation. And then at the end, we'll rotate for all of you to be able to um, ask us some questions. So we're going to go ahead and start learning all about this little nurse Yes. Okay. All right, guys, so I'm just going to walk you through the different parts of the little nurse shark. Sure, yeah. Okay, so we're actually going to start from the very beginning all over. So the skin of a nurse shark is very different to the skin of a lot of other sharks. It's very rough. And this comes with it being a very, very benthic animal. So that, what that means is it spends a lot of its life living on the bottom of the ocean underneath rocks and ledges and crevices and hiding. So it needs rough skin in order not to stretch itself up. Um, you will also notice just the overall shape of the nurse shark um, is very flat. And this allows it to live under these crevices. And its dorsal fin and um, its health second dorsal fin, are very bendy, and this allows it to be able to sneak under ledges to hide from its predators, and also to get through these ledges to find food items, like lobsters and any other things that could be living under there that they might want to eat. All right, so we'll start from the very tip of the nurse jar. So what you guys can see here, um, these little things that are pointing off of the tip of the nurse shark, they're actually called barbells, and they help them feel around for food. It's like an extra little sensory organ, like when you have fingers to feel around, they use these to feel around for food items, and the bottom of the ocean. And you can see a little mouth. So when you think of a shark, you may think of a scary, like, looking great white shark, like the one that they put on jaws with lots of teeth, whereas nurse sharks are a little bit different. What they actually have are these crushing plates. And they have the ability to suck in their food like a vacuum cleaner. And then they can crush, crush things like lobsters, or they can crush conch shells, which are like big snails, um, in order to eat food. So they don't need sharp in order to do this. Uh, next, uh, nurse sharks, as well as other sharks, have sensory organs, just like we do, that allow them to smell and hear. And they have these little things right here that are called nares, and that allows them to smell um, such things as like fish or anything that's made to sit on the bottom of the ocean that they might want to eat um, in order for them to find their food items. Um, nurse sharks are also able to hear. They have ears at the top of their head. It's hard to see, but they're located up here. And they also have spiracles that allow them to breathe. So these guys are a little special. They can actually sit on the bottom. They don't have to always constantly be moving. And they can push water through their mouth and through the spiracles and out through their gills, which you can see their gills right here. You can see the little slits. And that allows them to breathe while staying still under the water. And they can also breathe while they're moving through the water. Next, we'll look at their fins. So these are their little coral fins. And these guys are actually very special, where they can turn their down and use them to huh, almost like eat nuts to push them along the bottom of the ocean. Very cool. Um, next, we'll look at the pelvic fins. And this is actually 
a little boy. So you can actually see they have little claspers here, little finger-like protrusions that come down. Uh, and if this was a female nurture, uh, they wouldn't be present. All right. So then we also have the anal fin, and this is the second dorsal fin. And then sharks also have a caudal fin, which sticks at the back and helps them, helps um, move throughout the water column. And their sharks are actually very special. They have a specially shaped caudal fin without a fork, and that also helps them stay under the ledges um, just to condense them, to flatten them out a little bit more, um, because they like to spend the majority of their time kind of sitting on the bottom hiding under the things. Um, all right. Thank you. That's good. You guys want to do the chocolate fudge tags? Okay. Cool. All right. So now that you've met the shark and you've learned a little bit about the body, we're going to talk about some of the tags. So when a shark is caught, essentially we want to give it a name tag or like an eye tag. It's the cost system that you can use, but it's sort of like giving the shark a name tag. So if the lab or somebody else catches it again, um, this helps us to be able to learn something about the shark. So Anthony's going to talk to you about the different kind of tags that we're actually use. Hey guys, um, as Julian said, so out here we really want to be able to identify the sharks we work with. And um, with a lot of sharks, because they look very similar, we can't just do that by looking at them the same way you can look at your cat or dog or um, anything like that. So one of the one of the basic ways that we really try to identify them is using an extremely tiny tag, which you guys can see just at the bottom of this card right here. And that's called a pit tag. Now, speaking of cats and dogs, you guys have cats and dogs that are microchip um, that the vet might have put in there. This is the exact same type of tag, and we use it to really identify our sharks. Um, and it just gives us a, a code that has a bunch of letters and numbers in it that lets us identify who that shark is. Um, it's probably the most common tag we use it on our small guys, like a nurse shark in here, as well as our big sharks um, to up to our three and a half foot hammerhead work with sometimes. So uh, we, we uh, really, really rely on these tags to, to really help us uh, identify our sharks. Now the next one we'll use is called an NDART tag, or KC tag as we like to call them. And it just looks something like this. Uh, and, uh, like its name says, it has a dart down here at the bottom that will actually um, just put right under the skin of the shark. And then you have this monofilament that comes off of it and attaches to this vial. I don't know if you guys can see, it might be a little hard to see, but in this vial is a piece of paper that has letters and numbers on it. You guys can actually see this number in this one. And you can see number four right there in the middle of the screen. And again, that just helps us identify the shark. These actually help NOAA, which is the, the um, Oceanographic Administration in the States. Um, and this is their tag, but we really just use it to identify who the sharks are. Um, now, not all of our tags are there just to help us identify. We do add a couple others that give us some really, really great information on where the shark is spending its time, um, whether it's here in Bimini or elsewhere, like on the east coast of the United States. And these are our acoustic tags which you guys can see right here. Um, this is also kind of a bigger one that uh, we use these for, for different size sharks and different projects. But what these tags do is they actually emit a, a, an acoustic signal that is then picked up by receivers that we have set all around Bimini. And what those tags tell us when they hit the receivers is where that shark is spending its time. Because of course we know where exactly you put the receivers what type of habitat they live in, what type of depth they might be at. So it really gives us some good information on the types of habitats that sharks love. And that's part of this, the biggest thing we're trying to do with this project is figure out where they're spending their time. Now the really cool thing is we're part of a cooperative or just a group of people that have receivers um, around. You know, we have them around Bimini, but people have them along the East Coast. So what's really cool is we sometimes get to see our sharks go from Bimini over to places like Florida or even up north to, to Charleston, South Carolina. Um, people will find our team on their receipt and send us the information. So we can really see where sharks are going um, around Bimini and when they're not at Bimini. It's very, very, very cool. Now, one other thing that we use that you guys might be a little more familiar with are satellite tags. And we put those on our, our bigger, great hammerhead sharks. And what we really want to know is 
how long of a distance they can be traveling. And one of the coolest things we've done here at the lab is put it on one great hammerhead and have it travel all the way just about, what, 50 miles off the coast of Virginia in about 10 days. That's a long distance in such a short amount of time. And it's very cool to see that information because it tells us what other countries, the Bahamas and even the states, might need to work with to be able to protect each other because they can be such distances. Um, so all of our information is going into to trying to figure that out and help sharks out the best way we can. Um, so those are really our basic tags, guys, and they're, they're very cool, very unique. Actually, I'll have one more that i like to share with you guys. This is one we're not using on any of our projects, but it's, it's really cool to think about what, the, what we're able to do with the different types of technology. This is called an accelerometer tag. And you guys might be familiar with it if you have an iPod, iPod or an iPad where uh, you, know, you have your iPad that's up and down like this and you turn it on its side and the screen flips. It's, that's, this is an accelerometer. What this tag tell, lets us do is look at sharp movements um, is, you know, if we touch to the fin, we can tell when it's still or if it's slowly swimming or if it's uh, got a burst of speed and chasing down some prey. Um, so it's really cool to see different types of technology used to, to, to discover new things in animals and the, the type of lives they live. It's very, very cool. All right, so now we're going to walk you through um, what's called a workflow for sharks. So whether it was a tiger shark or a hammerhead or a little shark, um, people when scientists get sharks, they want to get some information from them. Is like 35 centimeters, which is pretty tiny. 
And its total length is about 49 centimeters total length. So he's a pretty tiny little shark. Um, as you can see, he still has his claws, so there's still plenty of time for him to grow. Um, so the next thing we can, we'll do, guys, um, like I told you, when we identify our sharks, we use that pit tag. Now, this is a pit tag reader, and this is what really helps us identify. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually push this button right in the center and scan it over each side of the shark just below its um, dorsal up here, okay? And that's going to help me identify who it is. And I'll try to show you guys the, uh, the code on the screen here so you can see how it works. First, I have to turn it on. There we go. All right, now it's easy. So you guys can see I've got the code right here. Everybody see that? Um, so that helps us identify who the shark is. Now, if it didn't happen, we'd actually need to put one of those in, and we use just a simple little needle, just like this, that will fit the tag into. So you guys can see that it's a pretty small tag that we use. And we'll just put that right under the skin and push this plunger. Yes, yeah, so again, this is the tag right here, and this is our applicator. Um, that we just put right in the skin and then push it right in. One of the other main things that we like to do during workup is make sure we take samples for DNA as well as isotope samples. So how we do that is we take little things like using these little scissors um, and we take it right, we take the isotope straight from the dorsal fin, so you take a little triangle, you can see it comes out and it feels really well after we do it, it does hurt the shark. And then we take DNA right from the bottom of the trailing edge of the dorsal fin. And this helps us to build a library um, for the DNA so we can see we can match them up in our data. And we can actually find brothers and sisters and moms and dads. We can see, um, it allows how all our nurses are here, in Italy, which is very, very cool. Um, we also can have our lemon sharks, our tiger sharks, um, a lot of species. And this is actually what the DNA will go in. It's a little vial, so there will be a piece of skin in there. And then this can be shipped off to different laboratories so they can analyze this, figure out what the shark's been eating, the DNA, the family tree, all from that little piece of skin put inside this tiny little vial. We actually have... Yeah, sure. So on this new shark, we actually have a little surprise. There's a little leech that has been living on the dorsal fin of this little new shark that I just removed. Um, so it's kind of like a little parasite that was just tagging along for the ride. But when we get these, we make a note of them in our little data book, and then we will remove them just for the, just for the health of the shark. <laughs> So this guy's doing pretty healthy. Um, your sharks are super healthy, your hardy species. So then we record the health of him before we release them. And then this guy's actually going to go back to his home. Um, he's going to go back to the pen, and then he'll be actually released back to the lodge where we found him um, to make sure he gets back home safely. So, so he's been very happy to meet all of you. Um, thank you guys for having us do the workout with him. I really appreciate it. <laughs> all right. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to do some questions. So we're going to rotate through and ask each class to um, go ahead and do two questions at a time. So we can sit out here. All right, so if we want to go ahead with um, Mrs. Kusuk's grade two, if you guys have some questions, you're welcome to hear them. So we can, we can see all of us. Sorry guys, just readjusting a little bit so everybody can see us. So, uh, yeah, if, if, if you have your great tier, if you have your questions and want to go ahead and ask us, you can unmute your microphone to do that.
Okay. And we have Ms. Canty's class. Do you guys have some questions for us? What are the black dots on the bottom of the shark for? What are the black dots on the bottom of the shark for? Yeah. Oh, so their shark are born covered in spots. So they see all the of mass and its value. But as they get older, they fade. But initially, it's believed that almost a change in color pattern, almost like stripes, but not like solid stripes, on the trunk. And the spots are covered with the camouflage because mom and dad sharks do not have the bodies at all. So this little shark, when it's about 11 inches when it's born, it's a small ruler, is on its own. Right? Mom and dad is gone. It has some fine little predators. Fine little predators. And spots are camouflaged and holds it under edges of rocks so it can stay safe and it's able to fly and grow up to a hunter shark, you know, further out on the creek. Great question. We have one more. We have one more. Canty's class. How many years can a shark live up to? How many years can a shark live up to? I mean, that is a great question. And we're very fortunate enough to be at Wapping. We've been working for 25 years, and we have a good idea of what that is, at least for lemon sharks, because that's what we've been working with for so long. Um, what we saw, we knew that females, when they're ready to have a baby, they'll come back to the baby about 15 years old. So um, the really cool thing was when we started our project, focusing all on the numbers, we saw that come back, not to 15 years, but every day that's the beginning, he's come back to have her baby. So that's 21 more years in the 15 years. So that makes a lot of value for the day. So we see that they'll be definitely 40 years. They'll be older than 45 or 45. Um, so, of course, that's the word. That's all we really do. Other species think that bird parts need to live 100 years or more. They're really just they're really the kind of life. Great question. All right, now we so for the panel to get your homework. I'd love to hear some questions from you. Yes, I think. Can you hear us now? Yes. Okay. Great. Right, yeah. Put see your question. Go. How Stand many up. kinds of sharks are in the world? Ah, there are over five different species of sharks. Um, even as recent as like last December, uh, there was He's called the shark. Um, that all black, light. Um, water sharks have the ability. They almost have like those in night lights. They leave it below. And so every new species that are being discovered, other reasons want to learn about sharks, and also protect it um, and help these species. Some of which we can leave it which um, is really exciting. Great. You guys have Okay, one more question. One more question. Uh, Tilly. How does the shark live underwater? How does the shark live underwater? Breathe. Oh, breathe. Breathe. Sorry, breathe. Sure. The way sharks live in the water, um, it's a little bit different how we above, that's for sure. So the way they is they push the water through their mouth, through their cerebral, and then through their gills. And that's what they get the oxygen that's in the water, and that allows them to breathe. So certain species, not like your sharks, but other species can be constantly moving for to push the water through their gills in order to get the oxygen. Anybody else have another question? Ella? 
Okay, good question. How fast do sharks swim? Their mouth 
Try and look at that and see if the recording of it actually works better. guys think